Man has, and will always be, simultaneously fascinated and terrified of the unknown. Change is the necessary ingredient for all advancement, and yet it is something very few of us can accept without a fight. In the quest to understand outer space, for instance, the Greek mathematician Pythagoras was the first to propose that the world was a sphere rotating on its own axis, an idea that seemed absurd to a 6th century BC society that believed in a flat, stationary world. They outcast Pythagoras and insisted that an invisible man with a chariot and flying horses dragged the sun across the sky each day. Supported by the newly formed Roman Catholic Church, this Earth-centered universe model remained generally accepted for 15 centuries. In that time, many scientists theorized that the model was incorrect, but few dare share their findings, and those who did were outcast. The last of these rebels was Galileo, the first astronomer to use a telescope and the last to be persecuted by the church for suggesting that the Earth traveled around the sun. He was summoned to answer on charges of heresy. At his trial before the church, Galileo was forced to curse, abjure, and detest his theory that the Earth moved around the sun. Had he not done this, he would have been burned alive at the stake. Although Galileo complied, he was ordered to spend the rest of his life under house arrest and was allowed no visitors or outside contact. Immediately after being sentenced, a stunned Galileo calmly declared, and yet the earth moves. Today, you know, all of our infrastructure is run by computers. I mean, computers are playing a central role, you know, in electricity, oil distribution, water, water treatment, um, finances, everything. You know, if you go roll back a few years in times, you didn't have computer attacks, uh, and computer viruses and worms doing things like causing air traffic delays, shutting down ATM systems, shutting down 911 emergency systems. So that wasn't happening so much, you know, now, now we get that, you know, that can happen. Cyber terror is a kind of warfare on the virtual frontier, consisting of either the destruction or the disruption of digital property. Sometimes, though, it can leap outside of the virtual realm into the physical world, such as when, for example, automated controls on power systems are attacked, and then they cause power outages, or they cause dams to burst, or pipelines to cease their flows. There is, if you will, an increasing interconnection between the virtual and the physical world. And this is the realm of the cyber terrorist. Terrorist groups are beginning to look at the possibilities of cyber terror, but they have to make a decision about whether to develop their own cyber terror capabilities or to recruit others from the outside, a friendly hacker, for example. Most of the hardcore terrorist groups out there, certainly the ones that I monitor, have no interest at all in hiring outside hackers because of the security risks that they entail. So they're trying to develop their own cyber terrorists from within their ranks. Someone who's already a radical, they want to turn into a hacker. If you will, they're going to take their alpha males and make, into, make them into alpha geeks. When I first started working with computer security, um, I think like a lot of security practitioners, I had this, this mental image that, you know, these guys at the CIA and the NSA and, and the FBI, you know, they were like, like the computer systems in Mission Impossible, you know, where they had these incredibly secure systems and they actually knew what they were doing. And within a couple of years, I realized I was teaching them. Imagine a bar graph. And government computer security is, is here. And corporate computer security is here. And my home network is up about there. We're all familiar with computer viruses. Computer viruses are self-replicating pieces of software. The newer versions of viruses are worms. And what those do is they're self-replicating pieces of software that know how to move around a network. A Trojan horse is um, 
a piece of software that gets onto your computer and allows the bad guy to come in around your firewalls or, or whatever defenses you've got and essentially attack you from the inside. And now you're looking at organizations that have basically taken what used to be a department that had human beings that could actually do the job and you've replaced it with a department that consists of a bunch of human beings who know how to click on a web page on a server someplace and fill out a form. And any place where you're in an economic situation where you are completely de-skilled de about the problem you're trying to solve, you're basically a born victim. You know, I think as computers continue to underpin our society and become really part of what we are, are now seeing, I think, is a really a digital nervous system that, that underpins our entire economy, we all have to be cognizant of the threat of computer crime and computer criminals. You know, a hacker isn't necessarily, in the, in the popular you know, vernacular, a bad thing. A hacker is somebody who explores, in, in, as a, in a quest for knowledge, will, will, wants to look at a system and see how it works. A cracker is somebody who takes those skills and uses them for, for ill, uses them for, for bad things. All hacking is, is expanding the boundaries, is, 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 is exploring. And instead of exploring the globe or exploring space, you're exploring the inner space of, of telecommunications networks, of the personal computer, and trying to find out what more you can do. Hacking, to me, is expressing the human drive to know more, to go farther, to, to experiment. And that, to me, is, is fundamental. I think the, the Wild West is the best analogy for this. I mean, uh, it, you're, you're in an area where the laws never really considered any of this stuff and where new things are happening and exciting things are happening and we don't know what's right and wrong exactly it's a little fuzzy yeah you know, a white hat hacker is someone who might say explore their own company uh, network to determine how it's vulnerable and how to protect against it uh, black hat hackers or crackers are those that use that knowledge and use that ability to make commit crimes and those are the people that we're interested in between the white hat good guys and the black hat bad guys is a very interesting character known as the gray hat, an ethical vigilante of the cyber west. Although he is not paid for his services, like the white hat, the curious gray hat takes it upon himself to hack into computers and find security holes. He then informs his victims of these holes in order to help them prevent any villainous black hats from later exploiting them for criminal purposes. They're individualists of the first degree. That's what they are. They're the cowboys. They're, they're out there on the edge of the Wild West, of the outlaw world, going out and, and, and trying new stuff and, and seeing where the borders are, seeing where the edges lie, seeing where you know, there be monsters. Well, what, what monsters are out there? And that's, we need those people. Uh, and you know, you got your Wyatt Earps who are going out there and trying to shut these guys down. It's very hard to make the distinction in legal and legal when you're talking hacking because intent is very much part of our criminal justice system. It's very hard to know what somebody's intent was. And I think that you can't use old uh, models and, and rules uh, and apply them to this, these new situations. They don't apply very well. As convoluted as its modern-day usage, the dictionary definition of the word hack is either the act of cutting through something with quick, unskilled blows, or the ability to find a way to manage a given challenge, such as when asked, can you hack it or not? How did this inconsistently defined word transform into what we know today as the hacker? Surprisingly, it was not through the computer, but through the model train. Thank you.
In 1946, the Tech Model Railroad Club was formed at MIT. Comprising of engineer students and model train enthusiasts of all ages, the purpose of the club was to constantly challenge and modify the functional design of model trains in order to hack a better train. They defined a hacker as one who applies ingenuity to create a clever result, called a hack. Still in operation today, the Tech Model Railroad Club remains proud that it originated the word hacker and openly resents the misapplication of the word to mean the committing of illegal acts of computer crimes. It is debatable how many stops the word hacker took on the journey from the model train to the computer, but all agree that chief among them was the telephone. Now in 1969, nobody had a computer at home. Phone freaking was, was, at that time, hacking the phone system. There were no computers to hack, there was only the phone system. I had always been working in electronics, experimenting around with things, trying different things, finding out why things weren't, weren't working, finding out things, why things did work and why they work so well and why others don't work so well. And I did mostly through experimentation, just by trial and error. I had not actually been the discoverer of the Captain Crunch Whistle. The Captain Crunch Whistle was discovered by the blind kids and uh, it, just, it was just by chance that they happened to uh, play around with the whistle and they experimented around with pressing different holes to get the different pitch, like they try this one, that's not 2600, with a perfect pitch, now that's 2600. The 2600 tone is used to activate and hang up the long distance trunk. You can go to San Francisco and from there, you can call 604-555-1212 and do this. And go. And, the, and you could dial numbers that way. Of course, you have to do it really fast and take a lot of skill to do it. I did it slow because I'm out of practice. I read a, a newspaper article that, that uh, it was now possible from certain cities to dial overseas directly without going through an operator. I said, gee, how is that possible? So through a little social engineering. Social engineering is an attack where basically what you're doing is you're fooling someone into giving you access to some place that you don't have any business being. And this is a technique that a lot of people have used, not just hackers. For example, sales guys will use social engineering to try to find out you know, who's the purchasing authority for such and such a product, they'll call and they'll pretend that they're somebody's buddy or something like that. So through a little social engineering, I was able to get an operator to tell me, oh, you dial Key Pulse 182 start, and that will get you to the overseas sender. From there, you just do Key Pulse 044, and the country code and the city code and the number start, and you get connected. Oh, wow. So I took down and mapped out the entire, uh, the entire country code of the world. Not only can I call countries, but I can experiment around with these codes. I can find out where, where these codes go to. And I discovered a lot of codes that were not published. The codes would, that would, would get into satellite systems and phone systems, or ship to shore phone systems. They have their own country code. The real of it was just understanding how the phone system worked. Exactly when the hacker was introduced to the computer depends on your definition of hacker. If you believe a hacker to be one who enjoys the intellectual challenge of creatively overcoming limitations, then hackers have been involved with each new development leading to the computer for centuries. One thing is for certain, that is that when the hackers finally did meet the modern day computer, they did not intrude upon them, they invented them. To those of us who are real hardcore in the computer industry, the word hacking was applied to people who hacked away all night long. People usually that didn't have uh, computers of their own, they didn't have any money, but they were at a university. And they found out that if they stayed up all night long, there were some computers unused. And they called it hacking because they hacked away. They took a program, hacked it up, and tried to make it a little better and a little better. Way back at the end of high school, I told my dad, I'm going to have a computer someday, and he said it costs as much as a house. And I said, well, I'll live in an apartment. I was going to have a computer even if it cost me a house. I got a phone call from a friend. Well, there's a group getting together, and they're interested in things like terminals. I had just designed a video terminal that worked with my home color TV. And so I could type in and talk to a thing called the ARPANET. The ARPANET was started by the military and hooked a whole bunch of campuses across the United States together so I could actually play ch uh, chess on a computer at MIT and bounce over to a computer at Stanford and see some files and over to Berkeley to other parts of the world long before the internet. I had to have that so I built my own terminal. And when Alan Bounds said, 
there's a computer club starting for people who have terminals and things. I thought, I'll be able to show off my great little low chip design. I went to the club, so excited about it, and found out that these people were all talking about microprocessors. Had suddenly made it possible to have a computer at a low cost. It came out of a group of people that were kind of liberal thinking about computers for the people. The, the whole mentality of the Homebrew Computer Club was extremely open. Information should be published, handed out, because basically we were creating stuff that was going to move the world forward, and we should do our, our best to be good contributors to society in that way. And that's really where that word hacker originated. For a long time, technology, computer technology, digital technology, was the realm of the hacker alone. People who were really into it, that was theirs. Big business laughed at. IBM said, there'll, there'll never be a market for more than 20 computers in the world. There's, never, there's no market for that. So personal computing was really created by hackers for hackers. And that's what, you know, we play with this stuff. Then business, industry, government started to say, oh, wait a minute. Oh, there's some money to be made here. And they started to take it over. Uh, first by commercializing the internet. Over the last decade, commercialization of the internet has exploded into a multi-billion dollar industry, prompting governments to argue that they must control the internet to ensure the economy's safety. ICANN was then created in 1998 by the U.S. government to manage the root servers of the entire internet. There, in Marina del Rey, California, 13 computers manage the domain names of the world, which are essential for the access and trafficking of all information on the Internet. Whoever controls these 13 computers controls the World Wide Web. The rest of the world rightfully opposed the U.S.-dominated control of ICANN, which was set to relinquish in 2006 when the U.N. would propose an international body to ensure that the net is available to all. But in a stunning declaration in 2005, the U.S. Department of Commerce declared that they would keep control of these 13 root servers indefinitely. Each country has its own top-level domain name, and previously ICANN could make no change of ownership of these without both countries' consent. Despite this, the U.S.-run ICANN turned over the country codes for Iraq and Kazakhstan to the United States, a foreign government, without requiring any consent from these countries' internet communities. This now sets precedent where ICANN has authority to regulate who runs which parts of the internet at any given time. Soon after, the popular search engine Google was asked by the U.S. Department of Justice to hand over information on who searched for what on the internet prompting one to ask what right any government has in asking for control of anything on a network set up for the sole purpose of open and free information sharing. Google valiantly refused. But what should happen if the day comes when governments stop asking for this kind of control? I think hacking skills are going to become critical to liberty in this country. Because as, as government and industry starts to realize they can use technology to shut people down, to reduce our liberties, the only freedom fighters out there will be hackers. The next war is not going to be fought with bullets and guns and bombs. It's going to be fought with code. It's going to be fought with technology, with computers. That's how the war is going to be fought. And if you want to preserve liberties in this country, I don't think it has anything to do with the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. It's the right to bear computers. And over time, and the newspapers and the media have tried to make hacking to be a word that means, oh my gosh, it's something bad, it's a threat, it's one of these invisible threats that you don't know about. Socrates was a humble Greek philosopher who debated with patrons in the streets, winning every argument yet crediting his opponents for any insights that may have arisen. He chose not to teach for money, as did the many professional sophists of the time, and yet he was considered by the masses to be the most wise of all men. The Athenian powers, however, paranoid over Athens' inevitable defeat by the attacking Spartans, concluded that intellectuals like Socrates were weakening Athenian society by undermining its traditional views and values. Socrates was arrested on charges of refusing to recognize the official gods of the state 
introducing new gods and corrupting the young. At his trial, Socrates insisted that he did not know enough to teach anybody anything, claiming, I am very conscious that I am not wise at all. He was sentenced to death by drinking a cup of poisonous herb called hemlock, which produces a slow death by gradually paralyzing the central nervous system. Socrates would be his own executioner. The philosopher was taken to the nearby jail where his sentence would be carried out in the comfort of his friends and disciples. When he drank the cup of hemlock, his friends could not help but weep. He consoled them. To fear death, my friends, is only to think ourselves wise without being wise, for it is to think that we know what we do not know. Society is always going to have trouble with people who want to push the envelope. Uh, societies are designed around conformity. What hacking is, is saying, I'm going to do it different. I'm going to see what else I can do. I'm going to see where else I can go. Society is never going to like that. Society will always make laws against that. And that's appropriate for society to do. But I would submit it's very important for society to have people who are willing to push the envelope. Otherwise, society doesn't grow. So hackers are a very, very important part of technology. Without it, you have no innovation, you have no growth, you have stagnation. And yet, they pose a threat because they are breaking the rules. They are going too far. That's their job. You got to have them. There's a lot of like just built in like a kind of church. Here's the dogma. And that's what we have in our society today, even in just government and people. Hackers are bad. It's just one of those church realms, you know, it's like hackers are Satan. In my, over my lifetime, the last 50 years, we have stomped out so many things that are seeds of creativity in this country. A lot of, a lot of teachers will just tell you we don't really have school systems that encourage the children to think of a problem and what could a solution be. No, just to identify the solution you were taught in this chapter and use that one. So we don't teach thinking as much as we teach, you know, rigorous rote. And intelligence is not defined as somebody having a brain that can think and think and consider all the possibilities and come up with the, the best solution. Oh, no, no. Intelligence is saying the exact same things as everyone else. You read the same newspaper articles, you watch the same news shows, you read the same books, and now you can say exactly the same things about how the world works so you all know you're a group. It's almost like a religion. And we're all the same and we're intelligent because I say it and you say it and you're intelligent, so I'm intelligent. And we never really have a real good way of measuring, are you really thinking and putting it together and coming up with your own solutions. No, we don't define that as intelligent. We often define it as dumb. Most hackers are of benign intent. They're just curious. And, uh, and those hackers who are destructive or criminal, they should be punished. I'm not interested in talking to those people on this show. The FBI doesn't track the average you know, white hat hacker, if you will. We don't have the resources or the interest in doing that. We're specifically interested in individuals that are breaking federal law. A script kitty is someone who doesn't have any technical ability or knowledge and takes prepackaged tools that have been constructed by individuals with more knowledge and simply runs a canned piece of code that's in essence a black box that is accomplishing usually bad things for them. Those are really ankle biters, if you will, from the law enforcement perspective. What we see as a growing and emerging threat is the professional cyber criminal. From the former Soviet Union, from Romania, from places like that where you have an educated populace that can uh, reach out and touch people here in the U.S. Uh, in a criminal sense, uh, whereas before it was virtually impossible to do that. So when I went to Russia in 88, um, I learned very quickly that Russian people, when they write programs, they, they execute the programs in their brain because they don't have a computer to run the programs. So they run them in their heads and they write bug-free code or code that's extremely good. And they've turned out that most of the best programmers are coming from Russia. A lot of people are starving for money there. And so it's not uncommon to find what are called large programming houses. These are houses where all these, where the huge networks are set up, usually out in the countryside, totally nondescript, mostly funded by the Russian Mafia types. The organized crime is very much involved in hacking, uh, for engaging in extortion and credit card fraud and identity theft and all these kinds of things. Uh, 
you know, these identity theft schemes, these phishing emails and related type activity, or even computer intrusion looking for personal data, they're looking for your identifying information. They want to be you. They want to be able to order merchandise in many cases, uh, or even take out home equity loans or even home mortgages as the person that they now own in a, in a sense because they have your name, address, uh, in some cases date of birth, social security number, credit card information, the uh, authentication code on the credit card, expiration date, et cetera. So they're looking to be able to profit financially in almost every case. There's also a great deal of concern about disruption of financial sectors and stock markets. In the real world, we've seen a number of attacks on the Taipei Stock Exchange. Uh, it is thought perhaps by hackers from mainland China and that's caused some fluctuations in stocks. Some estimates suggest that over a third of American gross national product is now web and net based. There's a, a vast conspiracy among financial institutions and government to hide the degree and the amount of hacking that's going on. Uh, FBI, Secret Service, the banking community, the financial community don't want you to know how often they're being hacked. It would rock people's confidence. Wireless networking is almost the poster child, from a computer security standpoint, of a technology that's extremely cool, that has suddenly become extremely pervasive, and as a result has been a security problem. Simply capturing uh, wavelengths around these various wireless hotspots that are being created, again for efficiency's sake, it's also creating magnets uh, to draw uh, the hackers who would get inside our systems. Uh, recent uh, news stories have shown that an airline had uh, curbside check-in over wireless. And this allowed anybody in the parking lot for that airport to have access to the internal system of the airline. With wireless access points, uh, if someone can pull up in front of your house with a computer, they can do pretty much anything they want anonymously on the internet. In almost the majority of cases, unsecured computers are used not to, not to uh, target the individual, the owner of the computer, but to, to use in furtherance uh, in the commission of another crime against somebody else. So you're being used uh, as the springboard for another crime without your knowledge. If they're a terrorist, they could be untraceable. Terrorists will use any tool at their disposal uh, to accomplish their goal of creating chaos and terror. And one of the ways I think that we're most concerned about that that might happen is through the uh, exploitation of computer networks, the interface where computer networks uh, meet or control our physical infrastructure. One of the things that the information warfare guys talked about was the electronic Pearl Harbor as this somehow massive attack that would be able to do us a tremendous amount of damage and you know, knock the U.S. off the pedestal of being a superpower overnight. It's the most bogus concept I've run across in a long time, and if you think about it, it's a lot like the real Pearl Harbor. What did the real Pearl Harbor do? The real Pearl Harbor caused the United States to enter into the Second World War and thoroughly kick the ass of the Japanese. From a strategic standpoint, Pearl Harbor was the dumbest thing that the Japanese could have done. The other one that I really like is that the cyber warriors shut down the automatic teller machine networks, and everyone panics and the economy collapses. Well, SQL Slammer took down Korea's automatic teller machine networks for three days. Korea is still here. They didn't panic. They waited until Monday to get cash. It just worked. Human beings are amazingly resilient. And what's happening is that these people are assuming that the entirety of human civilization is this house of cards that someone's going to be able to poke really hard and cause it to fall down. A lot of people oppose the notion that cyber terror is serious simply because it hasn't been serious yet. But there are some real world instances from the defense sector that say to me this is an extremely real problem and a very, very serious one. And the first of these took the form of a classified exercise known as eligible receiver, about which we can say only a very little it remains classified. What has been publicly reported is that the Pacific Fleet was basically put out of action by hackers during this exercise, and I'll leave it at that. The real-world incident that I think proves, to my mind more than anything else, that this is a real phenomenon is something that was publicly reported under the name of Moonlight Maze. And this was a case of real-world intrusions into classified defense information systems uh, with a great deal of compromise of them. And all I can say is that this problem went on for years. 
Uh, but anyone who has under any understanding of these issues knows that Moonlight Maze was the existence proof of a true, serious, and growing cyber threat. One of the greater concerns of those interested in stemming the tide of cyber terror is protecting our power grids. The nation's economy, its defense, its transportation systems all run entirely dependent on smooth flows of power. And if these were disrupted, the economic and the strategic consequences would be simply incalculable. Power for the American systems operate on something called SCADA, system control and data acquisition, which means the controls are entirely automated. In the case of a dam, for example, how much water to let through and how much to hold back. And if these controls are played with in some unfortunate fashion, uh, they could well result in a buildup of too much pressure at a particular area, or could simply by opening up all the sluices create uh, flooding downstream from a dam. A lot of gas pipelines uh, run on these SCADA systems and simple things like regulation of temperatures uh, could cause coagulation within pipelines or automated scrubbers working inside the pipelines to clean them could be used instead to block the pipelines causing uh, some kind of rupture. The Clinton administration came up with a number of good concepts for national information defenses. One of those was the idea of building a network between public and private actors. But you have to remember now that over 90% of all military communications go over civilian systems. So it's absolutely essential that we have this kind of public-private cooperation. In the military, for example, we have two extremely highly automated systems. It marries up equipment and troops being moved halfway around the world in a synchronized way. If either of those systems were intruded upon by hackers and disrupted, the delays that could be caused in the physical world could run in weeks to up to a month. In a place like the Korean Peninsula, Seoul is already in artillery range from the north, and so slowing down reinforcements coming to the peninsula, uh, that would make a very big difference. A SCADA system or any other kind of automated control system is vulnerable to the extent to which someone can gain access to it from the outside. Now, why do these networks wind up getting connected to the internet or connected through a firewall to, to some other network? It's so people can send email. You go to the systems administrators and you say, which systems can you never afford to have go down? And they'll say, the mainframe. Okay, so the mainframe must be segregated. And then everybody goes, well, they all need to get to the mainframe from their desktops. Okay. Then you're saying that the security perimeter around that mainframe has to encompass these desktops, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, then those desktops should not be connected to the internet. Well, how people read their email? Well, the, the simple answer there is you have to make an intelligent and rational decision. Is it more important that people be able to read their email? Or is it more important that that system be inviolable and tamper-proof? And if the answer is that that system really has to be kept safe, it's the control system for a nuclear reactor, it's the stock exchange, it's whatever, the answer is build two networks. We heard about the, the situation in New York on 9-11 where the ambulances couldn't talk to the police, who couldn't talk to the fire department, who couldn't talk to the FBI because they were all using different radio systems that couldn't interoperate. And this is a massive problem, and it's pervasive across all of federal computing. The GAO, I guess, issues these reports that rate the security of government systems. They do this periodically, and the, the grades that they assign to the government have often been you know, Ds and Fs. Our federal agencies have built these databases giving absolutely no thought to how to make them actually interoperate. Some of the people affiliated with the uh, Madrid train bombings, they had actually freaked the telephone system in order to make free phone calls prior to the, uh, to the bombings. It was uh, paid a lot of attention to when it was discovered that the Amish and Rico cult, the group that had used sarin gas in the to Tokyo subway, uh, was in the software development business and that they were developing software for Japanese business firms and including the Japanese government and that they could put um, back doors into that software and then exploit those. The, you know, the interesting case is the case that took place in Australia a few years ago. 
uh, somebody had hacked the uh, sewage treatment system and they were able to actually cause raw sewage overflows. And uh, so it, it caused some environmental damage and some marine life were killed. There are about five or six different cyber wars going on around the world today. Uh, one between, we think, some groups in mainland China attacking Taiwan, their stock exchange, various aspects of their infrastructure. When uh, India uh, detonated a nuclear blast, and Pakistan followed a few days later again in May 1998. What uh, happened was that a few days after the implant, our Atomic Research Center, which is India's uh, major nuclear installation, its website was hacked by a, an anti-nuclear group, a big group called Milwar. Uh, the first Pakistan group was called Pakistan Hackers Club. The second uh, group, which is probably the best, is one called Three Fort Pakistan. Uh, they broke into some of the networks of the army. They gave a warning to the Indira Gandhi Research, Nuclear Research uh, Center at Kalpakam, where Three Fort Pakistan had told them on Monday we will crash into you on Thursday afternoon. And, it, and despite having you know, four or three days' notice, uh, they, uh, Three Fort Pakistan did there's a cyber jihad going on along with the Intifada in Palestine against uh, the Israelis with a, a great deal of attacks upon uh, information infrastructures. The Israelis, however, have shown uh, very skilled defenses and have generally avoided much damage. Something I was a little more closely involved with occurred in Kosovo after our war there in 1999 when a group of Serb hackers called the Black Hand through distributed denial of service attacks were trying to prevent commerce from getting back on its feet. See, they didn't have a good cell phone service, they had very poor land lines of communication, so the web and the net were absolutely essential to rebuilding there, and all I can say in a general sense is, is that we were able to deal with that threat. Uh, the other extremely uh, important example of cyber war is coming out of Chechnya. This is one of those cases that we have to be extremely mindful of because there's a lot of information moving from the Chechens to Al-Qaeda and its other affiliates. The Chechens are also pioneers in cyber warfare with um, many innovative and vicious uh, viruses and worms being employed. The actual economic cost runs in the tens of billions of dollars for each of these incidents. I, I think something else that we need to be concerned about is the possibility of terrorists creating an incident like a power outage that's going to put people out on the streets on foot and then marry that attack up with uh, a biological uh, assault of some sort, some kind of, uh, in the military, we would call this combined arms approach. So a physical attack that would come along with the virtual attack. If you, as a hacker, brought down emergency services in an area and then destroyed a nuclear power plant, the effect of destroying the nuclear power plant would be far greater than if 911 were working, than if emergency services were working. Biological warfare is on top of everyone's mind in the world of terrorism. Imagine that terrorists first crack into New York City's infrastructure and shut down the power. That evening, instead of the standard thousands of people walking the streets, millions take foot on the commute home as was the case in the blackout of 1998. Now imagine 100 terrorists infected with a weaponized virus walking among these masses. After a week of the spreading disease, this one act of cyber terrorism would make the difference between thousands and millions of people dying, or possibly even be the cause of an irreversible health crisis. A computer intrusion could thus turn a germ into a weapon more deadly than a nuclear bomb. A possible yet daunting task for any terrorist organization to carry out, such a scenario becomes much more probable if organized by a foreign government. Now, the thing about China is that it has not done so much by students and teenagers 
in China, it is the PLAP, the Liberation Army, which is actually preparing for a very um, advanced program in information warfare. Here is a really organized initiative at the state level, at the army level. Well, they had conducted a type of war exercises of the army, which was directed against against the U.S. those were directed against Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. And there were simulations on how to bring the electronic infrastructure, their trading systems, the stock exchanges, uh, their electricity grid uh, to a halt. China's chief of staff and the several generals were involved in this uh, planning exercise. About 500 uh, soldiers were involved. They uh, did a lot of analysis on how they could uh, carry out uh, uh, what are called blitzkrieg attacks. It's a sudden uh, attack to paralyze the information network. So the primary aim was uh, uh, the U.S. aircraft carriers and some of the uh, missile uh, systems and then the aircraft. So, you know, they're trying to incorporate in theories of warfare. Uh, Sun Tzu had written the rules for warfare thousands of years ago. Uh, you try to get somebody else to carry out your assassination. The idea is to make you believe that it came from within, that they used uh, cracker groups in various other countries, such as Turin, to act as front of the PLA. People who are attacked will think that it has come out of the university, whereas it really has come out of China's uh, People's Liberation Army. I don't know how much time we have left before the radical develops the skills of the hacker, before the gap between the two is narrowed. I only know that it's not a great deal of time, and as I look around, I see very little effective preparation for this threat. I think uh, those in the, in the hacker community uh, realize that I have a respect for their skills, for what they do, and therefore for their ability to help us in the current conflict that, that we're in. And these are people who don't want to see a world in which terrorist organizations are blowing things up and moving on to the acquisition of biological or nuclear weapons. And they realize that global terror networks rely inordinately on the web and the net to coordinate their operations. So they're in a unique position to help us in the war on terror and we should be cultivating them. You know him as a guy who hacked Yahoo, AOL, Time Warner, MCI, WorldCom, Microsoft, and very famously, the New York Times, and that's just a few of his hacks. Adrian Lama, one of the most celebrated hackers in the world today. Do you define yourself as a hacker? Do you consider yourself a hacker? It's not a term that I try to sell myself as. Yeah. People use hacker to mean a lot of different things, and I really just do what I do. It's not limited to computers, so I really don't right. know if it's hacking. I think Adrian is a really example of a guy with very strongly held beliefs. So he would hack into systems, uh, find out where the vulnerabilities were, and he said, it's okay for me to hack these people as long as I tell them afterwards where their vulnerabilities are and help them fix it. That's okay. He's got a real knack for it. He's kind of, he's almost a savant when it comes to uh, cracking. Any company that you hear is common brand name pretty much had a router with WorldCom, had network connectivity with WorldCom, was managed by WorldCom. They were considered to be highly secure. They managed traffic for individual bank branches, potentially even for ATM devices. WorldCom used their employee social security numbers as identifiers, sort of pretty much as employee numbers. This cross-referenced with the corporate directory was useful. The passwords also weren't hard. Some of them had random alphanumeric passwords, but some of the companies that you do business with every day had passwords that were simple dictionary words, names of animals. Here you have companies that on one hand have paid millions of dollars for this network infrastructure and they can't even be bothered to think of a good password. We see the lack of a robu robust password policy, a lack of strong passwords. There's known as a brute force attack. When uh, intruders, hackers, or crackers can just repeatedly try every combination, every permutation of the alphabet or letter number combinations and eventually they're going to reach the, the right answer and gain entry to your account. However, there was another tool that allowed me to perform tests on routers. It would connect to the router via the phone system, it would log in, and it would check to see if the router was healthy. By combining these dial-up numbers and the logins, 
anyone, anyone at all with this information could have connected to each and every router that handled the data for Bank of America, Ford, Chrysler, NASA. There were very detailed routing paths, like I could see how the Goddard Space Center talked to NASA headquarters. Really in just the course of a few hours, anybody could have gone through and turned them all off. Network connectivity for a huge chunk of corporate America and for the government would have just gone away. Anybody thinking about it should be scared by the possibility of just how vulnerable it was to anybody that could have used that information. Because again, you didn't need to be a programmer. You didn't have to be a technical wizard. You could have done it from a payphone. Nobody would have ever known who was responsible for it. And he would find the flaws and notify the companies that had the flaws. And I was very much admired that philosophy in line with a lot of other hackers. They have this journal 2600. They all promote, we've got to be ethical hackers. You're going to be on our bad side and peer pressure is going to be against you if you go out and abuse this the wrong way, which means being destructive, destroying things, or if you're going to use it for your own personal gain to make profits and all that. His ethical scheme may not match society's or other people's, but he believes in it and he's living up to his own ethical precepts. And you got to admire a guy like that. There are these guys and they call themselves helpful hackers. I mean, the truth is that the media wants to portray these guys as helpful hackers because that makes them more interesting. Because the media doesn't have a very good story if they go and say, well, there's this borderline sociopath, Adrian Lamo, who breaks into these corporations in order to professionally humiliate the people who are responsible for managing the networks. And then for some reason, he expects us to thank him for that. Do you consider yourself on a mission to, to, to get these companies to realize that they have poor security plans? I don't consider it my responsibility to reform security in the world as we know it. Uh, I think, if anything, I'm on a mission to be in the right place at the right time. Most hackers, when they're trying to hack into something, they'll have all kinds of programs that they run. There's things that are called exploits, which spe target specific weaknesses. So they'll look for these weaknesses and try to target them. Adrian just goes to a web page and starts clicking around a little bit and all of a sudden he's at some sensitive company information. I mean, just the fact that he uses a web browser is from Kinko's. I've never seen him use anything other than just a web browser. Adrian never damaged any company that he had any dealings with. I mean, he never asked for money, never asked for anything. The companies that he helps is just a consequence of what he does. He doesn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to hack so-and-so or I'm going to help so-and-so. He just finds himself someplace looking at some information and thinks, you know, these people might want to close this down so other people don't follow my path in here. If I can get in here, other people can too. He is probably the best hacker I ever met. So as far as, I mean, if you were going to have a messiah of hackers, he would be it. He, he's a good example of a guy who lived on the fringes of society and didn't want to be part of mainstream society. He didn't want to hold down a job. He didn't want to go to college. He wanted to explore. We call you the homeless hacker because you, you don't have a residence that you live in all the time. You move around from friend's house to ha house. Is that how you do it? Or? I sort of have a long-term tendency to move around. I've been a little bit more stable lately, but I wouldn't say I'm slowing down. I never really started to travel. It sort of, sort of happened. I had an apartment in San Francisco. Um, for about six months or so, and I was working consistently at the time. I had the opportunity to save up money. Um, I realized Greyhound was cheaper, and it let me see more of the world, and I just started going places. I do it because it's what I do and what comes naturally to me. Yeah. In, a, in any environment that I'm in, I notice things and I follow up on them. I often meet people that have lived places their whole lives and find them terribly boring because they were raised there and only want, know one way of seeing it as this place that they're stuck and they want to get out of. And they're often amazed just by my sense of wonderment at many of the places around them, of my ability to just walk around and find so much uniqueness about it that they've lived with every day and never really noticed before. Life is just so full of possibilities. I had very low expenses. For a lot of the time, I could usually live on less than 50 bucks a week, 100 bucks a week if I had to. And frequently, I would end up somewhere where I, I knew nobody and had nowhere to go. And probably from when I was 18 or 19 up until 22 for three, so three or four years, I would decide that I wanted to visit some place and since, since I had my entire life on my back, I would just wander out and find myself never coming back and moving on to a new city. It spoke to what I, I, I'm sure 
must have been the sense of wonderment that the people that came before us, the people that discovered the areas, the cities that we now live in and inhabit, the people that sighted new land for the first time must have felt. It's the same sense, the same drive. It brought me so many moments of uniqueness, so many moments of joy, of things that I never would have experienced otherwise that it more than makes up for the moments of anxiety of not knowing if I would have a roof over my head in a storm. You know, there have been times that I've slept in abandoned buildings and that is just as important to me because of the sense of improbability, of the sense of newness, of uniqueness as any network, network compromise because, again, it's another layer of things that you don't usually see. I try to find locations that don't show signs of traffic and that are likely not to have anybody coming around, at least during the evening. Um, sometimes I've used construction sites that were active during the day, but at night were relatively secure as, as long as I got out before normal business hours. This gives me an idea of when the last time that this might have been used was. Um, Even the container of beef, beef broth mix is a little bit retro. And it's not that old, but the font is off. You, you don't see this in advertising anymore. Not unless somebody's trying to be deliberately retro, and they generally only do that on, on outside packaging. I think one of the, for me, at least, one of the prime ways of determining the age of the place that I'm in is the various brands that I find scattered around, the fonts they use, and the advertising they use, because that's one of the most distinctive marks of progression of time around civilization these days. And so far as I'm concerned, the most attractive aspect of this particular location is that it has two places where one could rest, the chair and the couch. Um, although the couch would be more comfortable, I would opt for the chair because it doesn't have a line of sight to the door. That way if somebody was going to walk in, the first thing that they saw wouldn't be me giving me time to react to their presence. That door has seen better days, but <laughs> it's also a bright side because since I don't have a line of sight to that door, if somebody were to come in, I'd be able to leave through there if I had to. I, my obvious preference would always be to be on some, someone's couch, but if it's a choice between not having a place to stay and staying here, I'd, I'd certainly choose here. I had been reading Yahoo News for some time, you know. it's a credible source. I mean, the CIA reads Yahoo News because it's one of the first places that AP wires post. But their page for editing news stories was accessible. It didn't require a password. It didn't require authentication. It didn't tell you, hey, this is a private page, please don't use it. It was just there. I think the first thing I did was edit the punctuation on the abbreviation of US on their front page. And I was just floored when I reloaded the page and it posted. I found a story about Dmitry Sklarov. He's a Russian programmer that was charged here in the United States based on some software that he produced. Legitimate software with legitimate purposes that allowed a user to bypass password protection on protected ebooks that would allow them to bypass the restrictions that are placed on that content. The penalties that they had in mind for him were ludicrous enough, but it was another one of those areas where I figured, you know, somebody's going to have to notice this. So I added a line stating that he was eligible for the death penalty. And added an additional one. Whomsoever told them that the truth shall set them free was obviously and grossly unfamiliar with federal law. The NSA is the entity that's tasked with monitoring electronic communications throughout the world. I figured somebody would have to notice this. Days over a week went by and nobody ever did. And I did a few other ones here and there. They had an option that allowed you to change stock tickers. Um, they get the actual feed for the stock, stock tickers in real time from the actual stock exchanges, but you could change the ticker symbols to indicate that two tickers had merged or that one had changed so that, say, I could have made Microsoft's stock reflect the values for Excite at Home. Journalism is a great venue for truth, but it's dangerous when people accept it so blindly. I had this access through September of 2001, and I found myself sitting looking at Yahoo News at all of the servers that they had added to keep up with the millions of hits on the morning of September 11th. And had anyone wanted to, they could have changed any aspect of the story. Shit! After September 11th, I had 
change of heart. You know, it's all about money and all that. But I started looking at things a lot differently, a lot of things differently, and our security being one of them. And I knew that I had a certain skill that I could apply to help secure the government's critical infrastructure. And I was 13 years old. I got into the program first. Um, the life around me greatly changed. I mean, for one, my analytical skills skyrocketed once I started programming. It's, it's more actually a burden uh, analyzing things crazily. And uh, just walking down the street, I, I look, I wonder how these buses work or how this door is opening, how this automatic door is opening. I just think about it. I think about the inner workings of it. It's a general understanding within the underground hacker community that emails and any type of communication to government officials or military most of the time don't listen to our warnings. I first tried to inform the government years back. I was 15, 16, 17, and then finally 18, 19. I don't see anything happening. I'm going to have to take the next step. And uh, basically the Deceptive Duo was created in order to publicly expose the vulnerabilities in uh, our critical information infrastructure. And uh, by doing that, we forced them to secure their systems or make our country more secure, electronically speaking. One of the most initial steps was targeting. We had to acquire the most likely target, you know, for a terrorist. We had to recreate the scenario as real as possible, you know, how it would play out as a, as a cyber terrorist attack. So what we did was we targeted certain uh, government military agencies, uh, the Navy, the Army, the Pentagon. We exposed specifically documents that we shouldn't have in the first place. What we did was illegal, yes, I'll admit that. We accessed their computers without their permission, but that was a the whole point, you know, we needed to do that. We needed to recreate a terrorist scenario. I remember some people, we would hack into some agencies and they'd know about it, obviously, because we defaced their homepage. They would fix their homepage, they'd put their original content back up, and yet <laughs> the hole is still open, the vulnerability is still there. They failed to patch it because we performed follow-up tests to ensure efficiency. Uh, we got tons of emails, tons of emails from supporters saying that, you know, they believed in what we were doing. We weren't looking to be called patriots. We weren't looking to be recognized as something like that. You know, we just wanted to do what we did. Yes, people would call us patriots, but, you know, refer to us as just hackers. That's it. You know, just people. Sometimes laws are inappropriate, and so, you know, I, I'm not opposed to civil disobedience. Okay, if, if people think that there are laws that are inappropriate and they, they feel, you know, from their conscience that they should break those laws in order to protest those laws, I don't have a problem with that. But I don't think we want to be encouraging our kids to do this. Well, a website, and they started out, the first one was conducted against the French government. And this was mid-90s. They called upon a, a lot of users to just point their browsers at particular French government websites and just click on the reload button, uh, you know, over and over again as fast as they could so as to generate traffic against the website. Uh, but over time, I think they became less effective because people found ways of um, being able to avert them. And in fact, some of the web sit-ins that were conducted by uh, EDT uh, were met by uh, counterattacks on the part of the governments that they hit. So uh, the Pentagon struck back in one case and basically crashed the uh, personal computers of the people who had were participating in the sit-in. Which is not to say that hacking computer systems is not a good thing to do to find vulnerabilities. I'm all for that, but do it with permission. Okay, let companies, let the government either use their own employees or hire outside consultants uh, and you do it in a controlled way uh, by people that you know and trust. And, and, and that's a good thing to do. Having worked for nonprofits as long as I did, I saw a lot of people that went in really energized about what they did, excited, feeling like they were doing something that they were good at, they could make a difference, and came out a couple of years later burnt out from having to take something that they loved and have it be their day job day after day no longer being something that they enjoyed, but instead had to go to work and do. And really no compensation would be worth that for me.
In 1962, Desmond Morris published his book, The Biology of Art, which details his experiments teaching chimpanzees to paint. The chimps enjoyed painting immensely and eagerly created works of energetic colors and strokes. One phase of Morris's experiment involved rewarding the chimps for producing their paintings. Whenever a chimpanzee painted, he received a peanut. Surprisingly, very soon the quality of paintings began to degenerate until the chimps produced the bare minimum that would satisfy the experimenter. Any joy found in the act of painting was lost as the chimps uncaringly slapped paint on their canvases and ran to collect their peanuts. You're just doing it because you like it. Were you always like this? I mean, as a kid, did you do this kind of thing? Um, as a kid in like the fifth grade, I would sift through teachers' garbage cans to see when the fire drills were coming up and when pop quizzes were, that sort of thing. <laughs> it gave me a sense of the system that I inhabited while I was going to school as it operated around me in ways that I would otherwise never see. Normally, I would just see the effects of these things. Oh, the fire alarm's ringing, but here I know there's planning for this. They have meetings. It happens on so-and-so dates for a reason. The fire department is warned. And it does me no good to know this, but it's still fascinating. Dumpster diving is the art and science of sifting through other people's trash. They frequently go into it with the sense of a target. They look for a company that they are interested in, or they look for a target-rich environment, an area that contains lots of interesting corporations that may have a common dumpster if the companies share a building. I don't go into dumpster diving with the sense that I'm going to come away with something that will help me with a particular target or a particular project. And I never know what I'm going to find. Sometimes I'll find printouts that have passwords or URLs or various other pieces of information that will grant me access to systems, but other times it'll be something totally random. Emails, communications that are just you know, random internal memos that have no intrinsic value for intrusion, but it's an artifact of corporate mentality, of the senses that people throw out things for the damnedest reasons. One of my dad's wireless microphones, he, he used to do video production, and I was playing around with one of his wireless mics. I heard a scream, and it was a child's scream, and it turned out that I was listening to a baby monitor from a nearby house. But the fact that this device here, intended for something completely different, could bring to me, just through the air, invisibly, sounds and experiences that were going on in a house across the block was really amazing to me. It's just the sense that, you know, this thing's intended for one thing, but look at what, what it can do. A baby that's born wants to explore. A brand new baby, a couple days old, you can clap your hands and their head kind of goes in your direction, built in with, I want to find out about the world. If you, could, if you carry a baby around and feel its muscles, they're pulling different places, then the baby will go right over and want to touch things in the house. Let him touch them. Let him feel what things are. Let him feel what things can fall. Occasionally something breaks. I believe in that. I think we're, our brain wants to have experiences and to learn how the world is constructed. And that's part of our growing up. And why should we inhibit it and think we are the guides and we will let this creature develop? Um, no, let much more of it come out. On the surface, it looks just like a sheer rock face. But as you walk towards it, it becomes apparent that there's a small hole in the ground. And somebody prior to us had spray painted a red arrow on the wall above it, pointing down. And while in the area, I saw so many people walk by it, glance at the arrow, and just sort of shrug. And I like to think that it's there for the people who would look at the arrow and wonder what it's pointing at, who would take the time out of their day to step forward and have a closer look. You know, I've, I've ended up in some pretty awkward places. I've done my share of crawling through mud, but the entrance to the mines was probably the most enclosed space that I've ever had to navigate. On the way in, you have to make your mind up ahead of time, whether you want your arms above your waist or below it, because once you're crawling, you're not going to be able to change. There's not enough room. It's easy to be paranoid, because many of the upper levels are flooded, and you have this sense of countless thousands, millions of gallons of water all sitting above you, knowing that the slightest thing could bring it all down. It continues underground, where the most impressive fixture that I got to was the underground lake lake is perfectly still, not even a ripple. It's not silent. There's constant dripping or rushing water depending on where you are. But if your light goes out, it's total darkness. And everyone's been in the dark, but it's sort of hard to appreciate the sense of total darkness, of having your eyes wide open and not being able to see a damn thing. Yeah, can you put it back on? Hi. And now can you take it off? Hi. I didn't go out with the intention of compromising the New York Times. I was initially looking at something else and somehow got sidetracked to the New York Times. 
they had a lot of information that was accessible to anybody that cared to browse around. For their internal system, the password by default was the last four digits of the social security number, and nobody ever changed it. People feel like social security numbers are these you know, private, secret things that nobody ever knows about, but anybody that wants one can get one for, really, once they sign up, sign up for any of the services that give them just a couple of pennies. Mine's 0427468804. Anybody could get it. It's not a big deal. From there, I had a list of every password at the New York Times. The culture in the late 1990s for anyone who was involved in stuff to do with the web was, here's this wonderful medium by which we can publish anything we want to. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our hard disk and we're going to publish it. Because we're dealing with high tech, you get the freedom of information advocates who go, you know, it's good, this information must be published. But to the guy in the field whose cover identity got blown, this could mean a bullet in the back of your neck. This is serious stuff and there are lives at stake. And because we Americans treat high tech as a toy, we don't take this stuff anywhere near seriously enough. We just treat it like it's something that we can change after we've made a profound mistake. I think that it's a really good illustration of competing mindsets where people believe that legislation somehow makes things secure. You know, legislation is fiction. It's up to people to believe in it before it will be effective. As a news organization, they should have known that social security numbers are not private. I mean, that nothing that's even remotely personally identifiable should be used as a login or as authentication or anything like that ever. I gained access to their subscriber database, information on who subscribed, their addresses, their billing information, their distributors, their billing information, their contributors, former presidents, actors, other politicians, people that are actually relevant if you believe in the whole international stage thing. And Don't so you worry about that though? That somebody's gonna come along and put you in handcuffs? I recognize that there was the possibility of consequences, but really I don't think that it's one of those things where consequences can be a deterrent because it, it's my nature, it's what comes naturally to me, and I think it's what comes naturally to a lot of people. Yeah. And I just figured that you know, while I'm doing it, I should do it in a way that sets a precedent so that anyone who, who ends up doing something similar to what I do might be in a situation where they can contact a company and the company can say, you know, this sort of thing has happened before, and maybe we don't have to put him in jail and things right. will be okay anyways. It's an impulse and it's something that I really don't think that I could stop doing if I tried. E even in a prison cell, I would find ways to find discrepancies and anomalies in the system, whatever it is that the system may be there. Well, we wish you luck. I hope you don't end up in a prison cell. Well, if, if I do, I'm sure I'll make an experience out of it. Richard Feynman, winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, was renowned for his adventurous antics in the world of science. In 1942, Feynman was invited to be a part of Oppenheimer's Manhattan Project at Los Alamos. There, he helped develop the first atomic bomb. With no entertainment at Los Alamos and needing to relieve his stress from the project, Feynman learned to pick locks and soon would leave safes and filing cabinets open in his colleagues' offices to show that the locks were faulty. Los Alamos was the most heavily guarded military installation in the United States. These safes and filing cabinets contained all the secrets of the Manhattan Project, everything about the atomic bomb. Feynman felt Los Alamos a very cooperative place where everyone was encouraged to point out things that should be improved. So he approached a colonel and explained the weakness of the locks, which was that so long as anyone left his safe or filing cabinet open, it was very easy for someone to examine the open lock and discover the combination. Feynman recommended that the colonel write a memo insisting that everybody at Los Alamos keep their safe and cabinets locked even during the workday because they were very vulnerable when open. The colonel agreed to post a memo, but to Feynman's surprise, the memo instead warned everyone to change the combinations on their locks, for Feynman knew how to pick the faulty locks and was thus himself the danger. It has been a long day. Um, I, you know, tracked down my cell phone and I was told that it had been ringing off the hook. My mother alluded to three cars currently parked, staggered along the block. Um, I'm concerned. Um, I'm concerned, probably a little bit paranoid, as I think almost anyone would be in my place. 
Um, I don't think that I would gain anything by going to pieces on this, and it would only hurt the people who care about me to see this weigh on me any more than it has to. And I don't have a clear idea of what the morning will bring, other than that I'll probably, for better or for worse, find out more and have to make some decisions. There is a big story just breaking now. Uh, a little earlier uh, today, I got a phone call from a production crew, uh, actually somebody from Kevin Spacey's Trigger Street Productions, right. uh, Dana Brunetti, and he called me up and said, we've got a film crew doing a documentary on hacking, mm -hmm. and they have been following around a guy named Adrian Lamo. You may remember Adrian Lamo. He's right, he doesn't steal any information, he doesn't take any, uh, anything and use it for bad, he's, right. he's a good hacker. So now when you said that they wanted to have a word with you, they actually have a warrant for your arrest right now, is that, is that correct? Yes, they have a federal arrest, arrest warrant out of New York City. And do you know what the charges are, Adrian? I just know nobody's saying anything, but right. I have reasons to believe that they relate to a criminal complaint that was made by the New York Times relating to my publicized intrusion into their systems last year. It took me by surprise how big the story was. I think it reflects a certain naivety on my part. I just didn't know that it would take on so much momentum. I think I misjudged the public mind in that respect because to me, the access at WorldCom, being able to essentially shut down the infrastructure for some of the most powerful companies in the world, that was important. The phone number for, you know, Rush Limbaugh, that's not so much. What are you going to do with that? But again, people are obsessed with celebrity, so that's what got play. Freelamo.org has a link on their page. It requires absolutely no criminal intent on the part of the person doing it. It requires no conscious effort to intrude. It requires no technical skill. You're going to a website. And as much as anybody might want to argue that because the website contained confidential information that it in itself was confidential, that's just silly. The fact remains that it was a public website. From a practical standpoint, you cannot put a database on the net where anybody can access it with no protections, no indication that it's confidential, and expect that nobody is going to access it. Lamos hacking tool is nothing more than a browser. And it seems to me that in Lamo's case is, use a browser, go to jail. Because that's pretty much what happened to Lamo. Well, the consequences of Lamo's arrest was very simple. It means now that computer hackers are gonna be a lot less inclined to point out system flaws that they discover. They're gonna keep them to themselves. Not been willing to report these security flaws means that these security flaws could be discovered by other people, like Al-Qaeda or terrorists or anything like that. They're certainly not gonna let the company know that they broke in, in their system. They're gonna keep it quiet and they're gonna do what they can and they're gonna exploit it to the best of their ability. That, of course, is bad. So it's important for a company to not prosecute somebody for finding a flaw in their system. They should reward them. Some people will argue that the New York Times erred in uh, bringing a case against him that the New York Times should have, you know, instead embraced him and said, oh, thank you for telling us about the problem that you found, and, uh, you know, here we'll, maybe we'll even pay you for your services. And that I'm very much against. Are you, are you, afra are you afraid, Adrian? I'm worried, and of course there's, there's always fear. Um, it's a shame that it had to come to this. I think that it could have been done better. I think that the New York Times could have conducted itself better. But if that's the president they want to set, I think that it's bad for them. It's bad for people that want to help security, and it's really bad for the companies that are getting intruded upon because it really cuts down their level of support. If you're the New York Times or somebody like this, and Adrian Lamo goes and breaks into your network, and then he calls you up and he says, I found a way to break into your network, and I'll tell you how to do it. Of course, I'm also going to tell the press about this, right? Now, what effect is that going to have on the network manager whose job it is to keep that network secure? You think he's going to be overwhelmed with gratitude? You think this guy is going to be popping champagne corks and going, wahoo, Adrian Lamo came and helped my network get better? This guy's going to probably lose his job. Adrian, I think, is a very accomplished hacker who, from a very interesting ethical point of view, said, I'm not going to hide my activities. I am, uh, you know, Adrian, I'm sure, was, is competent enough to not have been caught. But he, at, ne at no point did he try to hide what he was doing. Uh, be, from an, coming from a, a philosophical and ethical perspective that I have a lot of respect for. He's not the guy you should be worried about. The guy you should be worried about is the guy who is working for the mafia, 
who is you will never know about, you will never hear about. The guy, he doesn't boast in chat rooms. He doesn't put his name in the code. He doesn't say what school he goes to. He doesn't do a shout out to his peeps in the virus code. He's doing stuff cleverly and successfully, and you never hear about that stuff because, frankly, they can't catch him. And I hope that the people out there who are considering courses of life of their own will not let the people that want to criminalize curiosity stop them from doing what they want to do. To achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. In my view, hackers today are the latter-day equivalents of German rocket scientists at the end of World War II. Until May of 1945, Werner von Braun and his colleagues were trying to drop missiles on British and American troops. As soon as the war was over, they became our boys, as many of them as we could get, and they developed ballistic missiles, rockets. Our ability to go to the moon was dependent upon them. They were treated as heroes. When I was uh, growing up in, in the 1950s, Werner von Braun was, was my great uh, hero, and, and I really didn't pay attention to what he was doing when he was fighting against us. Well, today we have to look at these hackers and see that even though they do some malicious things, they have a knowledge that's extremely important to our security, uh, to our safety, and to our ability to confront uh, terror. I think government's real challenge right now is to bring them on the inside to help train our own information specialists to work to track terrorist organizations. Frankly, we could own all the master hackers in our country uh, for half the price of an advanced fighter jet. So we're not talking about much cost. We need to recruit these people. We need to use them. They're Americans too. They're patriots too. They can help win this war on terror. They count more than a carrier battle group, quite frankly. Unfortunately, we have a much different relationship between government and hackers today than we had between governments and those German rocket scientists nearly 60 years ago. We have, in fact, a poisoned relationship in which a hacker can do more hard time than an armed felon. Kevin Mitnick, for example, was quite famous for primarily being a social engineer with a lot of his uh, attacks. He would do stuff like he'd call uh, the telephone line crew support number and say, you know, hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm up here on a pole in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm trying to test a circuit. Could you reroute this or could you make this particular change? And it's amazing how effective those kinds of attacks are. There is a time when Kevin Mitnick hacked into the voicemail system. He re-recorded the voicemail with his voice of one of the VPs of Novell. And then what happened is he had placed a fake phone call with the engineer and said, hey, you know, just leave, leave the passcodes on my voicemail. Well, they then called back his voicemail, confirmed that it was him by hearing the same voice. So they had no problem to leave those passcodes on there. So it's just one of those things that where you're tricking people. You're, you're outsmarting them. One of the reporters, John Markoff, essentially invented the myth of Kevin Mitnick and aggrandized his crimes and his menace. And the upshot was that Mitnick went from being another relatively low profile case to being a top priority for the FBI. And that's one of the reasons that he ended up in custody without bail, without trial for as long as he did. He is languishing in jail for four years while waiting for trial. In other words, they threw him in jail without charging him a crime. And he did four years. You could have beat a prison guard over the head and gotten less periods of time in solitary confinement than he did. When Kevin was in prison, he was kept away from pay phones. They weren't afraid he was going to hack a voicemail system or open prison doors. They were afraid that he was going to whistle missile launch codes. They felt that he was dangerous enough that just off the top of his head, he could dial up a modem whistle the appropriate tones needed to connect, and whistle the appropriate codes to launch nuclear missiles. In many ways, his civil rights were violated uh, by a, a court system and a, 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 a legal system that just didn't know what to do with him. They were terrified of him. They were afraid of letting him go because they were afraid. They didn't know what he could do. What they did to him was criminal, and I think even they would admit now that they went too far. We're in a certain time right now that where things aren't completely ironed out when it comes to laws and the internet. I see government officials, a lot of them, just being 
completely against hackers because they're misinformed or they don't have enough information. And hackers, I think, they're more open to developing relationships with the government. Well, I knew it was going to happen. I, it's, it's, they have to do it. It's their job, you know. I first thought I was going to be raided because we set up uh, covert communications between each other, me and Ben Stark, another member of the Deceptive Duo. We were supposed to check in with each other every day, no matter what, to make sure that we didn't get raided. Because we knew we were going to get raided, we just didn't know exactly when. So finally a weekend came up and he didn't come online. And from there I, I took suspicion and stayed up all night because I knew they were going to come, didn't want to be rudely awakened. Sat in front of my computer, waited till they knocked on the door, as I suspected, and they did. They banged on it. They have, my sister let them in. I lived with my mom at the time, and I still do, but she didn't know what was going on. And at first she was pissed because she didn't really understand what was going on. She didn't know the whole story. Finally she read around, and sh she began to realize that, yeah, I did have some real intentions, some true motives. I think she has some sort of serenity within her, knowing that I'm fighting the good fight. Once the trial comes about, I think we're going to make some very good points, and hopefully some things will change. I think people realize that, you know, the these guys are offering something good to the community. I definitely feel the group was successful because I feel that I accomplished the goal I set out to do, was, which was to, to secure our nation's critical infrastructure as much as I could in the position I was in. I, I would love to help, you know, I would love to continue to help, but the situation does not permit me to. I was sitting in the rec room, and then the news came out on the TV about me being arrested and, and showing up in Lompoc, and everybody looked around and saw me there. So that was sort of how everybody knew that I was who I was, and that was where I'd actually I'd been approached by some underground mafia type who really wanted me to show them how to detect whether a phone's being tapped. I gave them bogus information because I thought he was a plant by the police. What I did not know was the fact that he had actually gone out there and verified that the information I was giving him was true or not. And then they came back and they beat the holy crap out of me. I mean, really, I was really screwed up, really bad. I mean, it ruptured the disc in my lower back, you know, so I couldn't walk for weeks at a time. And I never was the same physically ever again at that point. And if I let the guards know that I got beat up, then my life in prison would be as a snitch. And you don't want to have a snitch jacket when you're in jail, especially when you're in jail with a bunch of mafia types. You'll wind up stabbed the next day. He became known as the homeless hacker, crashing on friends' sofas while he did his work. Well, this morning, 22-year-old Adrian Lamo turned himself in to authorities. He faces two federal counts of unauthorized entry into the New York Times computer system, where he accessed thousands of private telephone numbers. Lamo has admitted to infiltrating more than more corporate computer systems, including Yahoo, MCI, and AOL. In terms of the message that this sends, I understand the government's point of view, at least I think I do. I understand that they feel they need to send a message that crime can't be tolerated no matter how well-intentioned it is, and I think that in some ways they're unable to look beyond that message. I don't think that they necessarily see the social impact of what they do. I believe that they're well-intentioned in wanting to prevent crime and wanting to prevent damage, but in the way that they're going about it, I believe that ultimately it's not going to achieve the goals that they think it will. It certainly strikes a blow against openness. It strikes a blow against people's ability to stumble across something and report it in good faith. I'm not a saint, and what I did was illegal no matter how well-intentioned I did it, but the fact that what they're essentially saying is that it doesn't matter if you come clean, it doesn't matter if you don't profit, it doesn't matter if you do no damage, it doesn't matter if you cooperate, you know, it doesn't matter if you discourage others from doing harm, we're still going to come after you. What does that leave people with? If they're going to come after me no matter what, then why exercise restraint? Why exercise good faith? Why be honest? But I hoped and believed that I could do it in a way that 
would set a precedent that would allow people to come forward in good faith to try and do the right thing, to let them believe that maybe motives did matter, that it wasn't all black and white. I think this is symptomatic of something that we see in our government today. In many ways, they're eliminating shades of gray. They want to polarize people. It's important to our national agenda today to see good guys and bad guys, because as soon as we start to believe that maybe it's not all black and white, that somebody can do wrong for a good reason, that not every action of law is inherently infallible. It strikes a very dangerous precedent for the government the way it wants to operate today. On the other hand, I believe this is positive because it places a certain amount of stress on the system we inhabit. It makes it much more difficult for people to remain neutral. It forces them to polarize. And when that happens, systems tend to evolve. Ultimately, I think it will lead us to a better place.